The Disney whistleblower problem is getting much, much worse with the House of Mouse now. It turns out that Congress now demands that Disney hand over all of their communications with one of the political campaigns this cycle. And we're here to tell you this could have a dramatic impact not only on who is the next CEO of the company, but whether or not the current CEO and his underlings are appearing for congressional testimony very soon. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Pro Channel where we are constantly inquiring as to the truth and we're happy to have you joining us in that inquiry. A quick disclaimer as we get ready to go into today's topic. Folks, we are not a political or partisan channel. We leave that to the political commentators and we believe there are some really good ones out there. We think you probably can find them. However, when politics and entertainment intertwine, that is to say, when the politics of the day encroach upon entertainment, well, we must go there. And in today's topic, we're dealing with the biggest entertainment company on the planet, and this topic could definitely impact not only its future, but even who the next CEO might be. Our guest, well, who might that be? It is the uh, legendary attorney Ron Coleman. And disclaimer, folks, Ron Coleman has uh, been a representative of this channel and of uh, our entities, and so we need to say that he is more than just a, a friend and panelist. Ron, welcome back. Thank you. And we're also going to disclaim the fact that I do represent um, the Trump campaign in a couple of legal matters. I was worried you were going to say Disney for a moment, Ron. And I was going to say, well, this is awkward. <laughs> that would be very awkward indeed. <laughs> and I'm speaking solely as an observer and in, in general terms. Uh, we're, I'm, we're not, to my knowledge, the campaign is not involved in any, any of these inquiries, but we you and I agreed that we're going to talk about congressional power to do this kind of stuff. And I took a little bit of a look into it and I'm prepared to sound as knowledgeable as I can. And also folks, Ron is uh, Ron is a man of humility. He would never say this, but uh, he has argued at the su Supreme court and been successful. He is uh, truly bringing the bona fides to this, uh, to this journey we're going to be on. So here we go, Ron, let's see what we've got. This is out of thatparkplace.com, the website that if you're not yet bookmarked, well, you should be. Whistleblower fiasco Disney demanded by Senator to release all communications with the Harris campaign. So everything between Disney and Harris, and that's going to get very interesting very fast. Folks, if you have not yet clicked that like button, well, we hope we've earned it by now. Here we go. The Walt Disney Company is facing more significant challenges to its position of unbiased news reporting. ABC News had been under significant pressure since it hosted the presidential debate earlier this month to reveal whether or not it facilitated an unfair advantage for one candidate, candidate over the other. Part of this scrutiny comes from the fact that the Disney-owned network repeatedly interrupted or fact-checked, quote-unquote, one candidate more than a dozen times while never doing so to the other. After an alleged whistleblower affidavit was uh, teased online, Disney and its moderators of the debate began to corroborate many of the accusations. Uh, Stephen Battaglio of the Los Angeles Times reported that Lindsey Davis, wearing pink glasses while speaking to the Times over breakfast at the Ritz-Carlton in Philadelphia, said the decision to attempt to correct the candidates was in response to the June 27th CNN debate between Trump and President Biden, whose poor performance led to his exit from the race. So in this affidavit, which uh, has been brought to us in a very peculiar way, Ron, and maybe we can talk about the uh, affidavit for a moment, uh, this was not brought out to the mainstream media, shocker, I know. And it is redacted in places that protect the identity of this person. It is supposedly uh, uh, delivered now to the uh, Speaker of the House, Mr. Johnson. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to corroborate all of this. But the weird thing about it, Ron, is that Disney has corroborated much of what's in it. So let's, let's go through what's in it and what Disney has uh, admitted to, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So in the, in the affidavit, Ron, um, the claim is that Disney met uh, with the Harris campaign in some way and assured them that uh, only the Harris campaign would be free from fact checking and that the Trump campaign would be fact checked. Well, that's that's largely corroborated now because that's pragmatically what happened and because the ABC moderators have now admitted that they practiced and they've given us the motivation for why they did so. The other thing is uh, that right, we are told. Right, so I'm, go, go ahead. I'm going to I'm I'm push back. Okay, please. First of all, we have it as you as you have observed. It, it is an unusual situation to have an affidavit 
in yes. a context where there's no legal proceeding taking place. So someone has, someone whom we don't know, has supposedly sworn to the truth of these matters. And in theory, could be prosecuted for perjury if they were found to be false. Okay. But it is unusual, again, to see an affidavit in this sort of free-floating way. It's and then well, to anonymity be too, right? It, it's it's bizarre to have anonymity tied to oh well, you could be prosecuted if we actually knew who you were and if we could actually verify what you say. Right. And well, I mean, look, if if the person is a whistleblower and doesn't want to get fired, it's understandable. But then why bother with the with the affidavit and just make a statement? Um, I, I mean, I understand why it spins better as an affidavit. But okay, that's just a context here. Now, your first point is the, the lack of fact-checking. I agree with you that we can see from what happened at the debate that it was not in any way even-handed and that there was no fact-checking of Kamala Harris. There was fact-checking of President Trump. Which, which is a categorical difference in the way that the candidates were handled. It was absolutely categorical. And they, they they can't but admit that it happened that way because it's an empirical fact. That's not the same, of course, and you didn't mean to suggest otherwise, but I do want it to be clear to listeners. That's not the same as saying that it's been acknowledged that this claim that such an arrangement was made, an order arrangement was made for that to happen has been confirmed. That we don't really know. Keep in mind, Whenever an accusation of um, corruption, this is in the nature impropriety. of corruption. Impropriety. It's a, one of those multiple syllabic words. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, is, is raised. You have to first ask yourself, how far is the conduct that we're complaining of from what it would have been if the allegations were not true? The, the ABC moderators here could absolutely be understood as being acting as acting entirely sincerely based on their own worldview of how of what their job is here their job as members of the corporate media is to support the democratic candidate they don't necessarily need a deal or need to be instructed by their management to do this so it's interesting if there was a deal made in advance and it's corrupt and it's improper, but I don't need the deal to believe that these people did what they did and enjoyed doing it because it's what they would have done anyway. Sure. Now, Ron, where I would give a slight pushback is it seems to me that this was more egregious. As we said, it's a category difference. So, for example, about a decade ago, uh, Monica Crowley attempted to fact check one of the candidates, then Mitt Romney. And she did so, and it was disputable whether or not she was accurate in her fact check, and it had an impact on the debate. Now, that was a scandal a decade ago. In, in today's modern world, that happened a baker's dozen times or more, and it was throughout the debate. So I think we've entered into, a, in, in, into sort of a, uh, an uncanny valley of crazy right now. You well, are I want to show you this. Now, now, I want to show you this uh, because this is where, you know, we're reporting on what's going on in the uh, on the Internet, right? And, and you've got this supposed affidavit that's still anonymous, and there are audio tapes that are supposed to be releasing in the near future that will corroborate the affidavit. That's what we're told. And so far, all the stuff we've been told about the affidavit continuously gets manifested in a way that gives it more veracity, but we're nowhere close to corroborating it. We need the audio, and that would be a first step. We'll still have to see what we can do to figure out, is it AI, is it not? But the way that Disney is responding, Ron, is what makes this so compelling now. So we've played this before. I want to play this for you and get your thought on it. And then we're going to get to uh, the, the congressional request in just a moment, folks. But Ron, this is Dana Walden. Dana Walden is very good friends with uh, Kamala Harris, and that's fine. There's no judgment there whatsoever. But Dana Walden is also the head of, of television and streaming at Disney. And she has she's largely seen as the almost presumptive next CEO of the company. 
She acted, according to the New York Times, as a quasi-liaison in getting rid of Bob Chapek, the former CEO who was working to moderate the company, and bring in Bob Iger, who's clearly uh, someone who is of a partisan nature. This is what Dana Walden had to say when she was asked directly about this allegation from this uh, whistleblower. Here we go. Got to talk about Kamala Harris. Obviously, the far right has come after you. The so far right. With her, so the debate was biased. What do you say to that? Um, you know, I really don't want to dignify it with much of a response. Uh, I have the highest regard for everyone at ABC News. It's the most professional organization, the most top-notch journalists, and it doesn't really dignify much of a response. All right, Ron, so uh, the answer was, I'm not going to answer, and we're all good. That was the answer. Now, it's, it's, it's what would you say? It's nested in moral authority of this is below me. I'm, I'm indignant that you would even do this. But that's the gist of it is, I won't respond to this, and we're all great people here. Why dare, how dare you ask? Does this strike you as the way that you would respond if asked a direct question about um, I might corrupt? Uh, well, no, I might, because... There, there is a corporate strategy to not dignifying every alle allegation with a response that has some legitimacy to it. And she, after all, is not with ABC News. She's over ABC News, right? But she's yes. in charge of streaming and TV. Um, I think there actually was a somewhat more specific statement that in my view was even which, which did address the allegations also yes. by not addressing them i don't Would know you if, like if to pull I, that I, yeah uh, please, ha yeah. happily we'll pull it up for you ron uh, this is from the same article uh, it says later disney would finally provide an official response to the allegations the company shared abc news followed the debate that both campaigns agreed on and which clearly state no topics or questions will be shared in advance with campaigns or candidates now Ron, that's not what's, a, that's not a good answer. That's not a good answer. And let me let me give you what's in the article about why that might be, and you tell me what you think about it. It says that the major problems with this statement uh, are one that again there was a categorical difference in the way that the candidates were treated, and it's unlikely, very unlikely, that one campaign went in knowing that that was how they were going to operate. And according again to the LA Times article interviewing one of the moderators, that was what was planned. Um, the other thing about this is that we believe, and everything that we've read states, now maybe there's some sort of uh, secret uh, document out there that goes against it, but everything we know is that the ABC News debate was supposed to follow the same rules exactly as the CNN debate. The CNN debate was widely known for having no fact-checking by moderators, and yet in the ABC News debate that happened. So when you have the uh, statement that ABC News followed the rules and yet we all watched with our, our eyes and heard with our ears that that might not have happened, starts to beg the question, what's going on here? I think you've got a different take on this, though, why you see it as flawed. Why is that wrong? Well, first of all, your, your point, it, this, this statement makes no mention at all of the fact-checking. But also, when you say, did you agree to that certain topics are off the table? And... When I ask you that and your response is, we didn't tell them what topics we would ask and we didn't share any questions. That's what we in my profession call a non-responsive answer. <laughs> I asked you, my question wasn't, did you say what you would discuss? My question was, did you say what you would not discuss? And it would have taken very little to merely add two or three words to that sentence to say what topics would be discussed or not discussed, and 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 your point going to your point as well, or with respect to questioning by the moderators, it is an absolute evasion. If in fact there is no there there, the whether it's a PR functionary or a legal functionary, or if it's two of them working together. They haven't done a very good job of answering this question. It's it's the kind of thing that uh, if this were a, a hearing or a trial, a questioning attorney would, um, I think the term is swoop, 
pounce, thing. I think, is what they often use when oh, they don't would, like it. Yes, no, we, that's right. We would pounce. We would not swoop. We would swoop also, but we would we would pounce on. Yeah. Well, let the pouncing continue then, and uh, let's read now what's happening with Congress. The UK Daily Mail is reporting that Congress has demanded that Disney turn over communications between itself and the Harris campaign. The outlet's Caitlin Carell reported, Congress is demanding that ABC News and Vice President Kamala Harris hand over any communications with the network and campaign team related to the debate earlier this month. It comes after a sworn affidavit emerged from a whistleblower claiming to be, uh, be a staffer with knowledge, and we all know this, so we'll continue on. The Hill, continuing, says that U.S. Senator Roger Marshall is requesting Disney provide those communications to his office. Marshall wrote a letter to ABC News President Alman, and I have uh, apologies, folks. Uh, we won't even try it, but... Uh, uh, Alman Kay and Harris campaign manager Julie Chavez Rodriguez. On debate night, it became abundantly clear that ABC News and its respective moderators had a biased agenda. The American people deserve transparency and accountability from the mainstream media and a full accounting of whether ABC News coordinated with the Harris campaign to skew the debate's questions and fact checking in favor of the VP. Marshall added. All right, so Ron, my question is uh, we don't know how the election is going to go. Uh, we'll see who. who uh, comes out on top with the executive branch after this is all over. If it doesn't go in the way that Disney wants, there might be some additional inquiry, inquiry into this. And I don't know how fast Congress could move if they want to move on this for Disney, but should they decide that they're going to investigate the House of Mouse? I'm curious, Ron, what would that look like in terms of congressional subpoenas? Um, would they be beholden to only look at official uh, corporate correspondence or can they go beyond? i.e., can they say, well, Dana, you're, you're very good friends with uh, Miss Harris, and, and we'd like to see your private correspondence as well. Is that possible? Where, where are the boundaries? Well, assuming first that we had a proper understanding of what Congress's oversight authority would be here. Congress, ha Congress has very broad oversight authority, but remember, these, these debates are not official government events. Let's set aside the fact that Kamala Harris is presently part of the executive branch of government. Generally, what Congress's oversight authority is limited to is things that it can legislate about. Now, Congress can legislate about a lot, but among the very few things Congress can't legislate about, although it wants to and it tries to, and certainly states do, like California, is what the press does. But let's, again, let's assume that you could properly identify a committee whose jurisdiction extended to an investigation into this matter. Once you had that established, then the oversight power is pretty profound. It's, it's not any less than that of a court. The main difference is that it is harder to enforce basically for Congress to get any kind of enforcement. As we know, the Justice Department has to run with the ball after a de deposition, I'm sorry, after a subpoena for either documents or testimony um, is not honored. If it's a Democrat, then the Justice Department won't do anything. And if it is a Republican, then as we see, the Justice Department will put the person and we'll have the person arrested, tried. And, and you and, suspect that that will not change regardless of the outcome, at least not close oh, enough or with, or with uh, haste that would change the course of this. Well, it's not going to change anything between now and the election. No, that's not going to happen. Right. But, but it, you know, there were a number of very good video uploads of Josh Hawley berating um, members of the administration yesterday that are available on YouTube, um, really ripping into them. And, you know, that's not as effective as bringing a claim and incarcerating someone like they've done to, you know, Bannon. And that's a shame and that's a real problem. But first answer to your question is Congress is power to investigate is no less than that of a court, at least technically. Again, the enforcement part of it is trickier, but there's no limitation to corporate documents only. 
uh, any relevant, if you, if someone, anytime someone gets a request, a legal request for documents, unless they have a privilege, attorney client privilege, executive privilege, if, if indeed the ordering authority has jurisdiction over that person, that person or that company has to produce any information, any documents that are within its control, its custody or control, as we say. So that would include not only corporate communications, but private communications that are made by people who are acting in connection with their work, or even if a third party, so, let someone works for an employee and talks to a third party who doesn't work for that, someone works for an employee, somebody works for a company, and that employee talks to a third party about something going on in the company, that's discoverable material, even if it's even if it's entirely private, it's your own email, it's your own text, that, th because since the company can tell the employee to produce the material that's within the, at least prima facie, that's within the custody or control of the company. Let's go now to uh, our, our final point here, and that is that uh, President Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, uh, has made a statement about this. He says, if it happened, it's disgraceful. It should be a national scandal. Uh, Ron this has made it up to the top of the campaign. My question for you, given what you've just said and explained to the audience out there, I don't want to uh, leave them wondering why did Prodot ask this, what do you think the chances might be that uh, someone like Bob Iger, Dana Walden, maybe the head of ABC News, that they, they might be called up to the Hill to testify and take difficult questions from people like uh, Josh Howley? What do you think the chances I, might be? I think the chances are pretty good. I wouldn't be surprised, and this is just merely my political amateur prognostication, if the Republicans increase their hold on the Senate, the chances are better. If it, if they may, if they may, if they remain a minority, the chances, even though minority members of a committee have the power to, to question, majority pretty much sets the agenda. Sure. So if the Republicans regain the Senate, and certainly if they regain the Senate by more than a seat or two, so that there's a little bit of elbow room there, then I think there's a chance that there might be someone who will try to, you know, get somewhere with this. So many other things would have to change, including the culture and staffing of the Justice Department for any of this to become uh, meaningful. But I, I think it's worth highlighting. I think there's, again, when Disney could have so easily, and Disney or ABC could have so easily have put these allegations to rest by squarely denying them precisely what was accused, we deny. They didn't do that. Instead, they denied things that were not, okay, maybe elsewhere someone said you got the topics, you got the questions, but that that's not the nature of what this so-called affidavit is claiming. Exactly. Um, I would just, I would just uh, wrap this up by saying, too, that Disney has a job, a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to do the best job they can of creating content that will be widely accepted. This company now has placed itself squarely into a partisan position, and they now are much more vulnerable dependent on how the election goes, as you're describing, and I agree with you. So I don't know why a company that is dedicated to running theme parks and making children's content, I don't understand why it would want to place itself upon a precipice in which, depending on how the election goes, they may or may not be taking very strong questions with their CEO on the stand. It's interesting, or at least if not the stand, a very large table with many photographers uh, in front and behind. So there you well, go. Well, think of how many times we discussed this in the Reedy Creek context, just as one example, it was an obviously poor political choice by the company. It was a bad judgment. It was, it was, it was unnecessary. It was gratuitous. It was wrong, not only morally wrong, but also they had no legal grounds on which to stand. 
They did it anyway. And the reason is, as I, you've heard me say a million times on your show and on Valiant's show, Disney's corporate culture is thoroughly, thoroughly soaked in political activism in a way that very few other companies, if any, in the country are. We sometimes call that ideologically captured. Folks, we hope we have captured you and enraptured you in all kinds of information that you just have to have over and over again. Consider clicking that like button, share, subscribe, click it, stick it to the algorithms. It is the notification bell and drop a comment down below. This is one of those videos we hope that you will share out on your favorite social media platforms. If you are not yet subscribed to Ron Coleman, well, you should be. His link for his uh, YouTube channel is down in the description below. But even beyond that, if you're not subscribed to him on X, well, you might actually be in the minority at this point. Get over there and get all the legal analysis that you definitely need. Folks, we're going to see you real soon. Thrice is nice right here on the channel. Three videos a day. And don't forget that 100K subscriber celebration coming to you Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We hope you'll be there. Until next time, folks, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. Ah, floral. It's time for you to walk the plank. What? Why? Because you, you haven't subscribed to WDW Pro yet. Nor bookmark that parkplace.com on your web browser to get great articles from great contributors. What?